Okay, we'll begin this session. So this is, uh, my name is Mike Scott, to moderate this session, and this is a session in which we, the problems that are gonna be presented, two projects here, uh, both of which were Goldstein Award finalist projects, uh, really focus on problems in which the victims or quasi-victims are really at the center of the project. There are obvious implications for offenders and places as well, but they really emphasize the victims. So the first presentation will be from work done in the Lancashire Constabulary in the United Kingdom, and Professor Stuart Kirby from the University of Central Lancashire will present. Stuart. Can you see me okay through the foliage? Yeah? Okay. So this, uh, this was all about high intensity callers who contacted Lancashire Police. Uh, what I'd like to do is split the presentation into five. So I'll talk about the concept of vulnerable callers. I'll give you a bit of an overview on the Lancashire Constabulary. Then we'll go through the SARA approach. I'll spend a bit more time on assessment and then we'll finish off with some uh, thoughts about the future. One of the undeniable facts is that since the uh, mid-1990s, uh, change in society has accelerated at an incredible rate. Uh, and of course, we were talking about routine activity theory. What that change does is creates more and more opportunities for offending. And we've seen that with increased mobility and technology. It creates so many more opportunities. But of course, crime, and this is recent research done by the College of Policing, uh, which is the body, don't know how to explain it really, it's, it's the body who's, uh, who's in charge of standards for policing and learning and development across policing in England and Wales. Some of their recent work on demand has shown that only 17% of all police calls relate to crime. And I think this is generally consistent with studies done across the US, which mainly uh, look at uh, demand from crime, uh, about 20%, 20 a, little bit, a little bit more. So there's a massive chunk of demand on the police which doesn't relate uh, directly to crime. And because of that, society is increasingly turning to a very visible and free at the point of delivery service. So the ambiguity of some of the issues that come out of uh, societal change when uh, members of the public get in a real sticky place, uh, who do they call? Uh, often it's the police. And over the years, a number of things have happened in the UK, and this is since about 2010. So the big thing that's occurred is that the uh, economic uh, problems, which were worldwide, certainly in the developed world, have really kicked in in the UK. And some police agencies in the UK have lost up to about a third of their resources, which is a massive amount. So police chiefs and government have been really concerned about how police organisations operate with that reduction in resources. The other thing that's been occurring is that politicians and other people uh, have been really frustrated by the police inability to use uh, good practice and proven research-based practice uh, commonly in what they do. And because of that, uh, vulnerability and those people uh, in vulnerable situations has come more and more to the fore. And we all know life isn't fair and problems fall disproportionately. So call it the Pareto principle or anything else, we know that problems are disproportionate uh, in relation to a small number of people, places, events over different elements of time. And perhaps one of the most celebrated cases in the US is Million Dollar Murray. There was a fantastic article by Malcolm Gladwell in The New Yorker, who basically uh, spoke to some street cops who followed uh, this homeless man 
who basically uh, got inebriated, started fighting, and he would either uh, end up in the police cells or in uh, accidents and emergency, depending on his uh, luck on that, in that particular fight. And they monitored uh, him over a 10-year period, and they estimated it cost the government $10 million to just uh, manage it. And the big question was, surely it would be mo so much cheaper to actually try and solve the problem of these uh, chronic uh, individuals who suffer from all these in, uh, vulnerabilities. Of course, uh, looking at vulnerability and looking at these non-crime issues uh, wasn't something that the UK, UK came up with. Uh, Herman Goldstein, in, uh, in his book in 1977, set out eight objectives for the police. And one of them, uh, which has particular resonance with this, is to assist those who cannot care for themselves, the intoxicated, the addicted, the mentally ill, the physically disabled, the old and the young. And as we can see, it's quite prophetic in terms of this uh, presentation. And one of the critical things that happened in 2015 was that the police, UK police oversight body, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, they announced that all uh, forces in England and Wales would be examined on their ability to identify and tackle vulnerabil uh, vulnerability. So this was a big issue because as you know, what gets measured uh, is what gets done. So all the police forces in England and Wales started focusing on what they would do on this particular element. Now, uh, just to make it more difficult, HMIC at that time didn't give any definition of vulnerability, and it was basically, you know it when you come across it. And the idea is pretty simple. So basically you get the small number of people who have got particular vulnerabilities, and they generate uh, the most need, which uh, generates a disproportionate level of demand. By focusing on those people, you reduce their need, and therefore you reduce demand. So similar to the concept around vehicle crime uh, some years ago, which was the main focus of all the, uh, the volume crime, do something in terms of security for those vehicles and you will see a significant uh, drop. But as I say, the real dilemma with this is, well, what is vulnerability? How do you identify it and how do you tackle it? And Lancashire Police, uh, as many other organisations across the UK, started to consider, using all their experience, what they could do about it. And I had the benefit at the time, because all the police forces were sort of really considering what they should do. I had a PhD student who was being part funded by the College of Policing, part funded by Lancashire Police, to do uh, his PhD on uh, vulnerability. And basically, uh, this is the definition the College of Policing have recently brought out. Uh, which, as you can see, is ambiguous as an ambiguous thing. Uh, but one of the things Scott Key did when he started doing his literature review was he did a simple scope of study to uh, uh, search to look at the level of articles being uh, written in terms of vulnerability and how it affects public sector. And as you can see, there is lots and lots of research uh, being done. The critical thing is how you take all that knowledge and how you put it in practice, which is a common theme for uh, policing, as we've uh, heard uh, yesterday. And what, uh, after, a f well, I was going to say after a few discussions, after many discussions and rewrites, basically what Scott did, and this was uh, written up for a paper, uh, basically said the concept of vulnerability can be divided into three. We've got very physical and personal vulnerabilities. We've got vulnerabilities that are facilitated by our social networks and our immediate family. 
And then we've got much wider vulnerabilities uh, in the wider environment. The issue is with vulnerability, it is so complex because it's multi-layered. So you might uh, be, everything might be, in your garden might be rosy, then you suffer a bereavement, which has been associated with uh, particular problems. You might lose your job. Uh, all these things might sort of uh, layer on top of each other. The other issue is that we know different people have different levels of uh, capacity to deal with their vulnerability. So uh, people might have the same problems affecting them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some people might deal with it better than others. And within all, this, uh, all these issues that are sort of running backwards and forwards, we've also got factors which are static, which cannot change, and also dynamic factors which can be worked on. So uh, Scott, as he came, as he emerged out of the, uh, the paperwork that was his literature review, uh, really hadn't found uh, a very clear way to tackle it. So we go to the Lancashire Constabulary. And just in terms of a uh, matter of reference for you, uh, that's where it's situated. So uh, that uh, uh, red blob on the left of England. So uh, it's sandwiched between Manchester and Liverpool uh, and uh, just, just in the northwest of England. So it's the 11th largest in terms of resources of the 43 police forces in England and Wales. It operates three divisions. Uh, it used to operate six, but because of the austerity measures, uh, they've tried to save management costs and squeeze those into three. Uh, it's just under 3,000 police officers, uh, just under 2,000 police staff, of which 330 are police community support officers. So for those of you who don't know PCSOs, basically a PCSO is somebody who uh, goes on uniform patrol in a slightly different uniform who has non-warranted powers. So they have very limited powers in terms of detaining people and generally they don't, uh, are able to arrest and uh, prosecute uh, the same way as regular officers. And these, of course, are supplemented by special constabulary, which are police volunteers, police cadet, and general volunteers. And as we can see there, that's what they deal with on an average day. What the constabulary did prior to this initiative was that any officer who went and dealt with a particular incident, if they thought that person was vulnerable in any way, they would put in a form. Uh, and as we'll see, that becomes relevant later. When this initiative kicked off uh, back in 2015, I was asked to join it. And one of the real benefits I thought from some of the funding at that time was that anything which had government funding had to have some evaluation attached to it. So uh, University of Central Lancashire and myself and a small team were put on it right from the outset uh, as a partner on this particular initiative. And what the constabulary also did was that they brought in 17 core partners, so local government, ambulance, mental health, adult social services, child services, uh, lots of different agencies. And every three months, we all sat around a very big table and I put this, uh, this slide up because often uh, when I sat around that table, I used to smile because all the different agendas that were running around that table and, you know, uh, universities included, it, was, uh, it just reminded me of a story. And uh, forgive me if you've heard it, but there's a man who, uh, who's got a hot air balloon. So he flies off and... Uh, his, his, his intention is to go and uh, meet, visit a friend's house. So after a while, he realizes he doesn't know where he is. So he sees a woman down below and he descends and he shouts to her, excuse me, can you help me? 
I've arranged, I've promised to meet a friend. I said I'd meet him an hour ago, but I don't know where I am. So the woman below looks up, she smiles, and she says, oh, she says, I can help you. I know exactly where you are. She said, uh, yes. She said, basically, you're in a hot air balloon. You're hovering approximately 30 feet above the ground. You're between 40 and 41 degrees north latitude and between 59 and 60 degrees west longitude. So the chap in the balloon looks down and he says, oh, you must be a university professor. And she says, yes, but how did you know? He said, well, everything you've told me is technically correct, but I don't know how, how, to, interpret, say, how to interpret your information. And the fact is, I'm still lost. Frankly, you've not been much help at all, and if anything, you've delayed my journey. So the university professor looks back, smiles, and said, oh, you must be a senior police officer. And he says, well, I am, but how on earth did you guess? He said, oh, she said, oh it's pretty straightforward. You don't, know, uh, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You made a promise, which you've no idea how to keep. You expect the people underneath you to solve your problems. And the fact is, you're in exactly the same position you were in before we met, but somehow it's, now it's all my fault. <laughs> so uh, I always say that, make sure there's a smattering of university professors and chief uh, senior police officers in the audience. And of course, you can sort of twist that story to lots of different organizations. And the truth is, we often speak different languages, we see things in different ways, and the trick is really bringing uh, that together. And some of the discussions around that table were really interesting because there was lots of criticism for mental health services and mental health services were saying, well, that's not mental health. That's not a mental health issue. It's, a, you know, it's an alcohol issue or, or whatever. So there were some fascinating arguments. And one of the beauties of uh, academia, and forgive, forgive me, I don't mean to offend, is you carry very little accountability. So you can point out, you can... Uh, summarize arguments, you can bring in the research evidence, but somebody else needs to make that operational decision. So let me get on to the presentation. Sorry, the, uh, the study. Uh, so basically, what Lancashire Police did, and uh, this was seen from San Diego back in 1996, I think, uh, what they did very clearly was to highlight their repeat callers to the police. And that's what Lancashire Police did. They, they had a central analyst who identified the top 100 callers from residential addresses. And what they then did was to filter out places like hospitals, uh, care homes, things like that, which as, a, which as an organization uh, would generate lots of calls. So they were after the individuals. They then passed these uh, details to local areas. Uh, to look at them and to see if they fitted the criteria of a vulnerable individual. And then what they did was that they assigned a lead professional. Now this person was somebody who probably already knew the individual and it was their role to coordinate everybody around this particular problem. And one of the things the lead professional did right at the outset was to go and interview the uh, person who was persistently calling uh, the police. And invariably, uh, the bench line was around 20 calls to the police per month. Uh, now, interestingly, of the ones which were on this list, 87% of them had already uh, been attended to by a police officer who had put in one of these uh, vulnerability forms. And one of the problems which that showed immediately was that there was no action plan with these individuals. So the officers would just keep going around saying they're vulnerable, but nothing spe specifically was done. So in the analysis phase, uh, basically what we wanted to do uh, was to find out exactly what these uh, behaviours and risk factors were which generated people uh, calling the police. And this is a long list of uh, 15 of them. And as we can see, uh, mental, health is, uh, mental health issues is the highest. 
and domestic abuse uh, is the second highest. Now, some of these uh, will be overlapping, so somebody uh, who's got a particular alcohol problem might also uh, ring the police around domestic abuse or something like that. So uh, the level of factors will be more than the individuals involved. Uh, so what we could, and the, the, sorry, the other thing which I was interested yesterday, there's a presentation on domestic abuse. What this also did was uh, they found, although they might have been called, somebody who had gone missing from home, things like that, uh, you could see what the actual cause of the particular uh, problem was. So domestic abuse was often related to alcoholism. Uh, missing from home was often related to uh, child sexual exploitation. Now, uh, before, <laughs> before I put the next slide up, I just need to explain it uh, to, to enable you not to uh, sort of drop into and start hyperventilating. So one of the things that we'd previously done, we use this... Uh, we use this statistical software package so called Smallest Space Analysis. And basically, what that does, it's not a traditional uh, statistical uh, software package. What it does, it takes each incident or risk factor or whatever you're trying to understand, and it checks how often it co-occurs with something else. Now, if it co-occurs often with something else, it puts as a plot on the map very close together with the one it co-occurs with. So basically, you've got a plot with lots of dots on it. If the dots are close together, they often co-occur together. If they're far apart, they very rarely or never co-occur together. So we put all these uh, 15 different factors into the software. We threw it in. We went for a cup of coffee. We came back and uh, it gave us the plot of the best fit. Now it's then up to the uh, researcher to see if there is a pattern in this data. And uh, this is the plot. So all those things I've previously shown you are now a point on the plot. And you can, it, it is completely discretionary where you draw your lines, if there's a straight line, if there's a squiggly line, things like that. But straight away, I saw a pattern in this data. Because what we saw on the left were youth factors. Uh, so basically, missing from home, closely associated with child sexual exploitation, closely associ associated with child under 18, obviously. Uh, so we see those. Uh, and to the right, we see elderly factors. So we see uh, people who are disabled, don't have to be uh, obviously elderly, but in these particular cases they were. Just going off the plot on the bottom right is uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, obviously elderly right in the middle. And isolation and loneliness was a really uh, big factor in all this. Uh, loneliness was... Uh, one of the driving forces for lots of people to contact the police, as, as was uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. And in the middle, we've got all those dynamic risk factors, so alcohol, uh, drugs, things like that, uh, and uh, violent uh, and impulsive acts such as missing from home. So straight away, what this does is it starts to be able to give you a handle on the underlying patterns that are uh, carrying on. And uh, we can understand how to put action plans in place. The, day, the obviously thing of concern there is elderly factors. Uh, old age, old age is a static risk factor and that won't change. So that's a particular concern, and as we know, the population is aging. So the next thing we did was we went to the response stage. Uh, this is a very bad pie chart of uh, the lead professionals. On the right, the 41% were dedicated police officers and police staff, so they're also P PCSOs, who were asked to take the lead. And then we, around the other side of the pie chart, we've got some other police units, such as those who specialise in domestic violence, 
but we also have charities, health services, and social services. So basically, they went and they tried to put a response in matched to the analysis of the problem. And I'll just put up a couple of quick ones for you. Uh, as we were talking about, uh, vulnerability is often multi-layered, so there are different issues going on. So social isolation, debt management, uh, find it very difficult in a chaotic lifestyle to make appointments. And as you can see, basically what the team did are just uh, support that person, but also being quite firm in terms of uh, what they would do. One of the, uh, some of the most brilliant are some of the most interesting. Uh, there was one, the, 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 uh, the person had nobody to talk to and they actually put a, a doll in the, in the house and just uh, over the course of uh, a few weeks just uh, started to uh, get this person to just uh, speak to this doll and the, they were saying the comfort they got out of that was amazing. Uh, somebody with dementia who uh, would always ring the police when they woke up in the middle of the night and got confused. They just put a sign next to the telephone. If you are confused, remember, ring your daughter on this number first rather than ring uh, the police. And again, that reduced uh, calls. We see uh, an awful lot in terms of <clears throat> mental illness and uh, alcohol and also health issues such as this case where the person had a stroke, again, uh, reduced their ability to deal with it. And often this feeling of isolation and unable to cope often uh, leads to drink or drugs in terms of self-medication. -medic and then this uh, final one, which is a lot more uh, violent, uh, this uh, two uh, a couple who live together, uh, basically both very violent towards each other, often fueled by alcohol. Uh, she, she'd previously, I don't know if you call them craft knives, uh, but these very thin bladed knives, she'd slashed his face, he'd fractured a jaw. Uh, they were calling the police 14 to 15 times a week. So you can imagine the demand uh, on the police just uh, from that household. We, what we did, because the police data is always very noisy and it's always very messy, what we like to do is triangulate it from as many areas as we possibly can. So we did lots of focus groups and one-to-one -one interviews with uh, the police, call operators, uh, we did them with the service users themselves. And we used traditional statistics to see if there was a significance in terms of before and after. Now, we only had six months data before and after, but as we can see here, the calls for service reduced uh, by 26%, which was statistically significant. The deployments reduced uh, by 6%, which wasn't statistically significant. Because of the fluctuation in some of this data, we'd need a longer period to assess. Uh, but those with mental health issues saw the biggest call reduction. They were the easiest to put a response to, which appeared effective. Uh, and again, that uh, reduced by 21%. <clears throat> we really wanted to try and see the impact in terms of the difference to the service user and we'd agreed and arranged a uh, factor uh, a questionnaire which we relate to as WEMWEBS so it's the Warwick and Edinburgh well-being scale so it's 14 questions ask people how they're feeling their level of optimism how useful they feel to others so it just basically gets their level of well-being and we'd asked the police officers or whoever was the lead professional to go through that questionnaire at the start and then do a follow-up. Well, the police officers just didn't like using this questionnaire. Uh, and we only got uh, these seven back. And the five out of seven, uh, the bigger, the, the higher the score, the better the feeling of well-being, uh, improvement. 
Uh, five out of the seven showed uh, an improvement in well-being, but we really didn't have a big enough sample to understand it. And then the final thing we did, because the, as the pie chart showed, there was such a lovely split between the, uh, the police staff who were dedicated to this initiative compared with all the other specialists. And we thought, well, it'd be an easy split to do to compare them, whether there was a difference between the impact of one team against all the others. And we did, we found, uh, we, we found uh, a difference in the level of calls. And we couldn't quite understand this. Why would a specialist in mental health, who was the lead professional, get a poorer result than somebody who had very little understanding of mental health uh, and uh, basically just spoke to that person and arranged meetings and treatments? And there were a number of things coming out, but basically, uh, Different specialists have thresholds, so they will only engage when a person gets to a certain level. And often in terms of problem-oriented policing and early intervention, you really don't want them to get worse because that's when they get chronic and it's much more difficult to turn them round. And the other uh, big difference was that the police officers were just, I don't know if you use the expression in your country, but they were just a lot gobbier. So they would, uh, they would be more assertive. They wouldn't accept it if people canceled meetings. They would go around and basically, uh, in a very, very kind way, just harass these people to try and turn their lives around. So it was fascinating. So the overall conclusion, uh, I... Uh, uh, Malcolm Sparrow, who was in the audience yesterday, has written a book, and I, I love the analogy he uses around problem solving. And he said, basically, problem solving is like a really tight knot. And in that knot, the best, the worst problem solvers basically uh, run up to the knot and think, oh, I know how to uh, untie it. And they just tug really hard on one of the strands. And what it does is it makes the knot tighter. The best problem solvers sit back and have a good look at that knot, and they just tease one element away and see what impact that has before going with anything else. And basically, these are our vulnerable callers. They live such chaotic lives, some of them, and vulnerability uh, layers on top of vulnerability, and it takes some unpicking. So the best problem solvers were the ones who really tried to understand how to unpick that uh, particular lifestyle. And uh, so overall, the programme showed that police demand, as well as an individual's lifestyle, can be affected positively through well-targeted proactive interventions, but the lead professional is critically important. And the risk factors, uh, sorry, the, the critical uh, elements which bring appear to bring success in our, uh, from our perspective was that real clarity in terms of uh, identifying what the problem actually is. So even though the person said it was a relationship problem or an alcohol problem, it could have been sort of vice versa. Uh, an evidence-based plan, uh, because those who put a plan together and agreed it with the vulnerable caller were more effective. Effective implementation was really, really important. The level of motivation of the subject was another critical thing. Some subjects who weren't particularly motivated could be persuaded, but if that person was motivated to change, it was so much easier. And again, the lead professional who was skilled and committed and able to engage with the subject. That's me. Thank you. Okay, very good, thank you, Stuart. So the second presentation um, is from the California Highway Patrol. Uh, this project was the Goldstein Award winner in its year, and it's gonna be presented by Professor Emeritus, uh, Gary Cordner. Gary?
So for a long time, I was uh, very, very jealous of people who had that, uh, that title of Professor Emeritus. And, and what I've learned is it, it's essentially a way of saying retired. And uh, at least in the kind of universities that I've spent my career in, uh, a, f a few, if any, uh, benefits beyond that. <laughs> so don't take too much from that. Um, I, I started my career in the police and uh, did work uh, altogether about six years in the police, and including uh, chief of police in a, in a small town in the U.S. Uh, before uh, shifting over uh, full time to the university work that I did eventually retire from. I really liked uh, Stewart's story, the balloon story. Uh, identify with it uh, very easily. Um, wish I had a story that good, uh, but I don't. Um, uh, nor do I have an accent as charming as uh, Stewart's, of course. Um, but there is a, I did learn one thing, uh, uh, spending so much time in higher education, um, and I'll ask the audience uh, if anyone knows the answer to this. Uh, do you know how many professors it takes to change a light bulb? Anyone? Ch change? <laughs> I think it has about the same ultimate uh, conclusion as his story. Um, as Michael said, uh, this project uh, is one that won the Goldstein Award for the best example of problem-oriented policing. Uh, this was about 15 years ago. Um, and I guess we should say most of you here probably know, but uh, the, the Goldstein, there's, there's an annual competition uh, in the U.S., but it's open to the world. Um, and uh, typically from year to year we get 30, 40, 50, and some years more uh, nominations. Uh, and uh, usually there are uh, four or five or six finalists who come and present at the annual conference, and ultimately one is chosen for the Goldstein Award. And often it's a very difficult uh, uh, choice, of course. It's also kind of interesting that Stuart and I are up here on these two projects. Uh, I think Lancashire, and California Highway Patrol may be the only agencies that have won the award more than once. Or if I'm wrong about that, then maybe there's one other agency in the world that's won it more than once. So these were sort of standout agencies uh, uh, in addition to um, uh, standout projects. But I'm not sure if Lancashire is as good as it used to be since uh, Stuart retired. Um, uh, Another thing I want to point out about this project, in case I forget to emphasize it later, that I think is important, um, uh, is, a, a, again, I think in, uh, similar to Stewart's uh, uh, project. Um, this is an example of a pop project that is not focused on crime, or at least not as most people typically think about what crime is. I think Herman mentioned yesterday that the crime is sort of a, a, a useless and ridiculous concept, um, uh, you know, to guide our activity. Um, th this, again, is, is an example of that. And is, I think both of our projects are an illustration that uh, problem-oriented policing uh, is often focused on things other than crime. It's focused on the problems that are thrown in the lap of the police, that the police are expected to do something about, and oftentimes don't actually uh, involve crime, or at least uh, crime as we often uh, think about it. Uh, so in that sense, problem-oriented policing is, is, I would argue, broader than criminology. It's not some kind of subset, unless we wanted to put criminology under problem-oriented policing as a subset of it. I don't think that's the way most people, at least in higher ed, would think of it, but. I think that's where the way it really works. Um, I also think, related to the same issue, but slightly different perhaps, um, uh, in the world that, that we operate in, uh, as I understand it, uh, as, as I've lived it, I suppose, um, <clears throat> most of the focus of policing, of police reform, of police improvement, uh, most of the research that's been aimed at uh, trying to figure out how to make policing better uh, for about the last 40 years has been mainly focused on 
uh, trying to figure out how the police can do a better job of controlling crime. Uh, and again, for understandable reasons. Uh, this again sits, I think, outside that mainstream uh, in that it's focused on something that isn't crime. And I would also argue that in, the, in American policing, and I don't know if this is true in any other countries, that the, 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 the political pressure to do something about crime and within the profession of policing, the, the, the focus on figuring out what works in reducing crime has been so strong that uh, many within American policing, I would say, have sort of lost track or, or at least uh, 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 deprioritized many of the other functions that society counts on the police to perform uh, that, that aren't directly related to you know, that, that thing, crime. Uh, and so in this case, uh, this is sort of a traffic-related or traffic safety-related pop project. Um, uh, and I think it focuses on what is obviously a tremendously important kind of problem. Deaths and terrible injuries and huge financial costs result, of course, from traffic crashes. Uh, and yet within the police world, uh, in, at least I think especially among the sort of big thinkers in American policing that have guided the development of, of American policing over the last 30 or 40 years, the traffic function is like nothing. You know, it's like not worthy of discussion almost. I'm probably over, overstating that, but I think it's a kind of policing that has slipped in, its, uh, in the emphasis given to it. So and that's another reason why I really, I really like this project. <clears throat> so just a little bit of background. And by the way, I, I, let me say one more uh, thing preliminarily. I think this is in some ways a much, more, a much simpler project than the one that Stuart described, and probably simpler than many of the other ones we've already heard about here at this conference, or, or sort of more straightforward, um, which is another reason why I'm giving such a long introduction, because once I get into it, it's pretty brief. <laughs> um, so uh, needless to say, uh, this occurred in California, uh, it's great, uh, even an international audience, you don't have to explain to people where California is because I think everyone knows. Um, uh, this particular project focused on the central region of California, which is uh, a very big and strong uh, agricultural region, a farming region. Uh, you can see some of the information there on the, on the slide. I think the key uh, uh, things to, to, to recognize are the main focus of this uh, project <clears throat> was on making things safer for victims. And, and it's on this panel that's mostly focused on victims. In this case, the victims, if you, again, would want to call them that, the people at risk, uh, were primarily farm workers uh, and primarily migrant farm workers, uh, uh, of which uh, there are hundreds of thousands uh, in California, uh, mostly from Mexico, especially at the time that this uh, took place. Uh, the setting is California, our biggest uh, uh, state in population, uh, uh, a state that's very well known, of course, to everyone. The, the police agency that was the lead on this project uh, is the California Highway Patrol. Uh, I should say, for our international guests, um, uh, that this is one of the state police agencies as opposed to local in the U.S. Uh, and of course in the U.S. most of our policing is in fact done by local city and town police departments, municipal. But this is, this is an example of a state police. Um, the California Highway Patrol uh, is a large agency. Um, uh, typically uh, when we see lists of the largest agencies in the U.S., it's in the top 10 uh, somewhere. Uh, has about seven or 8,000 sworn or warranted uh, police, uh, as well as a thousand or two civilians. It's a big agency by our standards in the U.S. Um, and it is, as the name implies, primarily focused on traffic safety. When we have an agency that we call Highway Patrol, it usually means that traffic enforcement, traffic safety is their primary responsibility. And that is true for the California Highway Patrol. They're not strictly limited to that, but that's where most of their effort uh, and activity is focused. So this, uh, this problem arose, came to the attention 
uh, of the California Highway Patrol and others uh, as possibly a, a, a situation, a problem that needed to be addressed as a result of one specific event. Uh, and it was a fatal crash, traffic crash, um, uh, a crash that in which 13 people died. Uh, those who died were all uh, f uh, farm workers. They were all riding in a, a van. What's the UK word for van? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show a picture in, 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 in a slide or two in case there's any confusion about that. Uh, the workers were seated on benches, uh, you know, in the, in the rear of the van, as opposed to chairs, seats like you're sitting in. Uh, they uh, were not wearing seat belts, nor was the, the back part of the vehicle equipped with seat belts. So they were just sitting on benches, you know, inside this... Uh, a rolling container. Uh, also, the driver was unlicensed. In fact, the driver's license had been uh, uh, suspended or revoked for previous violations. Um, uh, and as you can see, the crash occurred at 5 a.m. Uh, uh, they were uh, on their way uh, to work in a field uh, somewhere there in central California in that, uh, uh, in that uh, agricultural region. The, pic region. the picture here is, is not the driver of the van but the driver of the truck that the van crashed into. Uh, in fact, that truck was making a U-turn uh, on a sort of country road, not a, not a main highway specifically, was making a U-turn, and the van uh, literally crashed into it uh, at, at quite high speed. So that was the, that was the incident. Uh, the California Highway Patrol was responsible for investigating that particular crash. It wasn't difficult to determine what had happened and to, uh, you know, assign blame to the driver for, uh, for failing to drive properly. That, uh, you know, that sort of incident level uh, response was, was straightforward. Um, but it, because of the nature of the incident, the 13 deaths, uh, there was a, a lot of attention on it both within the agency and publicly. So the California Highway Patrol attempted to analyze uh, the larger problem, or at least to determine if there was a larger problem uh, that, uh, uh, that this uh, one incident uh, exemplified. Uh, they, they, at that course, we're talking about almost 20 years ago, but they had automated data, but there were no fields in their data for farm labor vehicles. So they couldn't do any you know, straightforward automate, uh, automated data analysis to really dig into this problem, they ended up having to do a lot of hand searching of past records to figure out whether this was a kind of incident that occurred frequently or not. Uh, they, they literally didn't know from their data. Uh, so they did a lot of hand searching. What they figured out, looking back almost 10 years, was that there were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50 crashes involving farm labor vehicles per year in the central region. Uh, they didn't attempt to look at it for the entire state, but this region is really where the, the, the farm labor uh, situation was most, uh, most, most dense anyway. And then they also checked for fatalities. They've, they found that they had not had some kind of huge number of fatalities, you know, year in and year out. The average was less than five fatal uh, per year in the region resulting from those approximately 50, fatal, uh, 50 crashes that they had each year. Many of the crashes did result in multiple injuries, but again, the number of fatalities was not, was not something astronomical. Again, I think the, the, the interesting point is that they, it took this uh, extreme incident to draw their attention uh, and attempt to analyze the problem to figure out, was there something more here? Uh, there's, a, there's a picture on the top of sort of the typical a vehicle at the time and, and, and how the, the passengers would be seated on side benches in the back of the vehicle, as well as probably sitting on uh, water coolers or, or boxes in the middle. Sort of people packed in uh, probably as, as tightly as they could. Now the picture on the bottom is not the typical uh, farm labor vehicle even in California 20 years ago, but the picture on the bottom is a typical uh, transport vehicle for laborers in Mexico, 
at the time, and perhaps still today, I'm not quite sure. But that would be a very common way to transport a large number of people to a job in Mexico. I uh, put that picture up in part because it, it shows that for the people involved, the, the workers involved, sitting in the back of a van on benches uh, was prob probably did not strike them uh, as inherently extremely dangerous, probably maybe even safer than what they had been used to back in Mexico. Okay. Um, but the analysis that the Highway Patrol did, in, ad in addition to just figuring out how many of these crashes do we have, is they found out some very important things, which they may have realized some of these before, but it, it focused attention on them. One is that the fact that, that these vehicles did not have seat belts was not illegal. Uh, in fact, California uh, traffic law at that time did not require such vehicles to have seat belts in the back. Uh, they also found out that there was no specific inspection program uh, in California uh, targeting farm labor uh, vehicles, farm labor uh, transportation. There was a general inspection, vehicle inspection system, which looked at, you know, pollution control and do the tires have good tread and so forth, but there was nothing specific to the farm labor vehicles. Um, again, part of what they found was that this sort of transportation, or, or even more dangerous, was actually quite common in Mexico, um, uh, uh, normal, if you will. Uh, also, that many of the drivers of these farm labor vehicles in California were also uh, uh, migrant workers from Mexico, and many of them were not terribly experienced drivers. Uh, of course, in some cases, didn't even have licenses, but, but most often had a license, but were not necessarily uh, fam uh, ex very familiar with driving or driving larger vehicles. And also, of course, a, a, an additional part of the problem for the police in this situation was that the, the, the individuals involved, both the drivers and the workers, uh, brought with them to California uh, a, a lot of distrust and fear of police in general. Uh, their interactions, uh, if they had had them with police back in Mexico, undoubtedly had not been very positive. So they weren't likely, you know, to go straight to the police if they thought they saw a situation that was unsafe. They're more likely to, to not want to talk to the police. So what did the California Highway Patrol do? Um, uh, once they sort of had their arms around or at least some understanding of the situation? Well, probably the, you know, the, the, one of the key uh, factors in the response stage was an amendment to the law uh, to in fact require seat belts in the back of farm labor vehicles and, and other vehicles that transported people, uh, vans as we saw in the previous picture, that top picture there. Uh, and interestingly, uh, that law was changed within less than two months of the accident that killed 13 people. So it was a quick response. Uh, I'm sure, you know, the legislators, uh, uh, politicians were under some pressure. Uh, and uh, the, the Highway Patrol um, was, I, I think, adding to the pressure. They, they, they strongly encouraged the, the change in the law. Uh, another thing that the new law did is it specifically made the owners and operators of the vehicle uh, responsible, uh, not just for, uh, responsible for uh, driving properly, but specifically responsible for making sure that the, that the vehicle was equipped as required by law for the purpose that it was being used. So that, that new law put the onus on owners and operators, the drivers as well as whoever owned it. Um, and then they, the law also established and the California Highway Patrol immediately implemented an annual inspection system for those farm labor vehicles, which included a new sticker to put on the windshield of the vehicle to show whether it had been inspected and passed inspection within you know, the past year. So a visible indication that yes, it, yes, it met the standard or no, it didn't. Um, they created a program, gave it an acronym. I already forget what the SAFE stood for, but it, it was created as a program within the California Highway Patrol with uh, personnel dedicated to this purpose. Uh, they, besides the inspections, uh, the, the, the required annual inspection, they also uh, added in regularly scheduled ad hoc inspections 
they would, uh, of course, go to uh, work sites um, and check the vehicles. Um, uh, they were regularly scheduled, though sometimes unannounced, but they were principally non-punitive. So in other words, uh, unlike probably most traffic police in the U.S., uh, they didn't go there just to see how many tickets they could write, but they went there to check the safety of the vehicles and to get any vehicles that were unsafe, that didn't meet standards, out of circulation. And they did increase enforcement, especially during the, the, the growing season. Uh, but the, the sort of second half of the response, in addition to the change in the law, the implementation of a, of a regulation scheme with inspections and invisible indication, was a lot of public education. Uh, they set up a tip line, they outreached to stakeholder groups, and this was very important because these were not groups that were normally you know, cozy with the police. Uh, they employed bilingual officers uh, so that they could easily communicate with the farm workers, the drivers of the vehicles, and anyone else involved. Uh, they created all kinds of really nice brochures and flyers. They spent a lot of time on radio and television. Uh, the, the, the handful of officers most involved in this became local celebrities uh, because they were on TV so much and they showed up so often that at uh, you know, fairs and camps and, and all that sort of thing. They, they became very well-known individuals within the network, especially of the farm workers and so on. So there was a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, public information uh, campaign associated with it. <clears throat> um, did they implement the response? Uh, all indications was that it was quite systematically implemented. Uh, as you can see, the numbers up there, but they inspected uh, over 3,000 vehicles. Uh, they were able to certify as meeting the law uh, uh, over 1,000. There were uh, over 500 that were literally taken out of service, which meant they didn't meet the law, and, and immediately uh, the owner or the operator was, uh, you know, was, was informed that they could not use that vehicle until it was brought up to standard to transport farm workers. They did, they did issue over 1,000 citations, made almost 200 presentations, I always love it when, you, when they show how many people attended, because you know it's just the officer making a presentation and guessing how many people are in the audience. Just like Stewart will put down 200 uh, attendees when he reports this to his university next week. Um, and they made some 80 uh, radio and television uh, appearances. And this is all within a relatively short period of time. Um, so what happened? Uh, there were no fatalities for the first two years following implementation. Uh, there was a 75% reduction in injuries, a 73% reduction in crashes. Um, uh, two additional things that happened. This, again, this all started in central uh, Pennsylvania, you know, within one of the uh, administrative subunits of the California Highway Patrol, but then they expanded it statewide. Of course, when the new law was, was adopted, that was all, already statewide, but the inspection schemes and everything else were expanded statewide. Uh, and there was also another amendment to the law within about a year or two uh, that required not only the seat belts, but that the benches had to be forward spacing. So in other words, again, that top picture there uh, was no longer legal. Uh, you couldn't have side facing, it had to be forward facing. And of course that was based on um, uh, well-known principles of uh, passenger safety in vehicles. Um, so, uh, let me not go quite there yet. Um, uh, I've followed up with the, the Highway Patrol to some degree already. Uh, I'm told that not only were there no fatalities for the first two years following this program, I'm told that there have been zero fatalities since then in farm labor vehicles in California. Uh, I don't really have the data. That seems almost unbelievable to me, right? I mean, just. So many vehicles, they're going to crash into each other, people are going to get hurt, and some are going to die. But I'm told there have been zero fatalities since then. Um, when, we, when I prepare under Michael's direction the, uh, the written version of this, I'll try to get more complete data so that I can say, that, say whatever the, the uh, sustainability issue is, uh, I'll be able to say it with a little bit more confidence. But every indication is that this is one of those examples of a very specific problem with a relatively clear-cut cause, and uh, uh, we had a cliff's edge uh, uh, drop, and uh, as far as we know, it has stayed uh, right down there where it went. And so, for, especially for those of you not from California, this explains uh, what they think of the rest of the country.
Very good. Thank you, Gary. Uh, one question I wanted to ask uh, on this. It um, is generally understood that seat belts do not prevent vehicle crashes. They just mitigate the injuries if they happen. But here, we're seeing some reduction in crashes as well. Is there anything that you read in the report or that might indicate what, what might this seatbelt mandate and the inspection scheme might have done to contribute to the reduction in crashes? I don't remember reading anything. This one? Yes, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, I don't remember reading anything about that, so I'm probably just going to speculate slightly. Um, uh, I would think that the, uh, the, the, the heavy uh, attention you know, public attention, uh, focus uh, on the issue, um, probably uh, led the owners of the vehicles and the, uh, uh, the managers, employers of the farm workers to pay a little bit more attention to who was driving. Um, and, and whether they're licensed and properly they, trained. Right, I, I, I would guess that that would be at least one factor. But beyond that, I, I guess I don't really know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to entertain any comments or questions for Stuart or for Gary. Mike. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation and, and a good history lesson. I always like to uh, see uh, a, a work like this revisited and, and, and reworked because I, I do think we have short memories. My question is to you, Gary, and it's uh, I'm always interested, and in, in if you can remember the political framework, the political uh, temperature that there was uh, in California at the time. Were there any protagonists who were anti this work? Was this, uh, and, and you've semi-answered this question with that, the feeling that there might have been a, 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 a swell, a groundswell of other uh, initiatives, you know, like a focus on the drivers and things like that. But I'm particularly interested in, you know, the, if you, if you know, the employers, the, the farmers' uh, view of all this. I, I don't think I do uh, have uh, uh, much insight on that. Um, I, I think this was probably, again, I'm a bit speculating, uh, that this one incident was uh, was so grievous um, that uh, at the at the very least the the, the farmers the owners the managers um, uh, you know had to be seen as protecting people's lives. Um, uh, California has a long history of, of using migrant workers, you know, to uh, to plant the crops and then to get in the crops. Uh, they, couldn't succeed without them, would, you know, the state would go bankrupt if they didn't have that, that large labor force. Um, uh, and of course, also California has a long history of uh, uh, trying to figure out how to treat such workers uh, properly and fairly and, and, and uh, uh, pay them, you know, pay them fairly and all that. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but beyond that, I don't, I don't know this the specific sort of a response or reaction to, you know, from the ownership. Um, I mean, we can certainly anticipate that uh, someone would have said, wait a minute, I can't afford to do that. That'll put me out of business or something. I, I think maybe this, this might be an example um, where, where it turned out that the situation was so out of step, at, you know, prior to the change in the law and so forth, it was so out of step with what probably everybody recognized as safe practice that it would have been difficult once it was brought to public attention to dodge it? It actually, I think it's really a fascinating question. It transcends either of these particular projects, but what, what is it that genuinely animates a police department to take these problems seriously when for a, in, in many cases, the analysis of these problems indicates that there's been some significant neglect of the problem for a long, long time? meaning that there wasn't really this political pressure, this internal motivation. 
In the case of the California Highway Patrol Initiative, I don't know. I, I know that the commissioner of the California Highway Patrol at that time, a gentleman named Joe Farrow, was a very bright man, had been exposed to the problem-oriented policing stuff, made sense to him. So he, in turn, was putting some pressure on district commanders and some encouragement as well to think this way, to at least plant the seed that these problems are preventable if we can put our minds to them. Um, we had a, a couple of years following this initiative. There was another one out of Lancashire that won the Goldstein Award that year. And it was also about uh, traffic crashes in the rural part of, of Lancashire. And it had to do with agriculture, but it was a twist on it. The problem was motorcyclists, many of them middle-aged men like us, uh, late in life, buying that Harley Davidson or something and going off into the country to ride, would ride up into the, the farmlands of Lancashire only to come around a curve and hit a, a patch of wet mud that would cause them to lose control of the bike and crash and injure or kill themselves. And the constable who worked on this really took the initiative uh, to, to pay attention to this problem. Why did he do that? Well, maybe he was inspired to try to win a, an award. That's okay. He was also a motorcyclist himself, I think, and so he had a personal stake in this. But it's one of those problems that could very well have just continued not to get any attention for quite some time without some happy coincidence, convergence of factors that compel some individual, some organization to take these seriously. I, I would ask uh, Stuart whether on this, uh, your vulnerable callers initiative, uh, what animated the, the focus on this? I, I think one of the real benefits of preparing for a presentation is you start to reflect more on the lead up and all the reasons. And what really surprised me was, it was hey, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary decision to uh, measure or inspect police forces on how they identify and tackle vulnerability. And I have to say, it really surprised me because it was a major policy change without any, I hadn't picked up any wider discussions and to launch it without a definition of what vulnerability was, allowing different police forces to go in whatever direction they wanted. You could argue, well, that's great because it innovates and it brings out creativity. But on the other hand, you don't really know what, what you're being measured against. So uh, I, it, it really interested me, that, uh, that decision. Yeah, Gary. And, and back to the California one, the other, the other thing that uh, I think may have sort of been part of the context, uh, is, again, this is 20 years ago, I think within California and within the California Highway Patrol, uh, there at that point was a growing recognition that they needed to develop a better uh, engagement with Hispanic uh, Americans, Spanish-speaking uh, uh, people, uh, whether re whether uh, migrant workers or you know um, uh, residents, uh, they had created a, a, a really significant program which they called El Protector, uh, designed to try to convince uh, people who had come from uh, Mexico and Central America that the, that the police in California were actually there to protect them, not just uh, you know get bribes from them and make their lives miserable. Uh, and, I, and so I think maybe that was already established, you know, uh, an, an established initiative. And so this particular example uh, fit into that nicely. Yeah, and of course, uh, as we know now, this, the general public attitudes or political attitudes, either in favor of immigrants or hostile to immigrants, can wax and wane. And this might have been at a period in which there is at least some, some waxing. <laughs> Sylvia? Let's get the microphone so we can record. Thank you. I think this also highlights the importance of recognizing who are the super controllers. You know, John Eck and Rana Samson stuff, I, you know, I value that all the time. One of the key things I will do is actually who has the power because we can, we can work with lots of people, lots of agencies, lots of communities, but there are specific 
people that have the power to make something happen, whether or not it's a partner of a drug abuser on a programme, whether or not it's a major organisation lead, or whether it's a government, you know. But actually, for me, I think that both your cases highlight the value of those, recognising who they are. I'm just curious, uh, Sylvia, and you're listening to this, who do you perceive as being among the super controllers in these two initiatives? I've no idea. I would think possibly with, with regard to yours, Gary, maybe, you know, somebody within the legislature, whatever you call it, legislation or whatever, um, whoever was a, um, a leader within the, uh, the migrant community, because you can't work with them all, but you pick the key people uh, who you need to work with. Uh, with yours, Stuart, there would probably be a number of super controllers, I would think, for both of you. Um, you know, within the police organization, there would be somebody key that, was, that would be driving, there would be somebody within EAT that would be driving it. Um, but I just think it highlighted for me the value that you can't, you know, you need to work with different people, but who do you need to focus on that can make something happen? So. Yeah, very good. Other comments, questions? Ron? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, Ron Clark here. Um, terrific presentations. I, I really enjoyed both of them, very clear and sharp. Congratulations. Um, I might have missed this, uh, um, Stuart, but uh, could you say a little bit more about the, uh, the lead professionals, who they were? Uh, have you got some order of lead professionals? So uh, the lead professional was a practitioner who was uh, in the front line of dealing with these cases. So what the Lancashire Police did was that they put aside uh, people in a team who would just do that particular role. Uh, they had some police officers, but also they had uh, basically anybody who showed interest in wanting to do that work because it was a very different type of work. So they had uh, a number, and they were probably only about, uh, about 25 of those. But often because these were repeat callers to many different public sector organisations, so if they rang the police, they always uh, rang social services, they rang the ambulance. So they were, they were well known to a lot of different organisations. And it was found that some of these organisations already had somebody who was aligned with them, who was sort of monitoring them more than anything else. If that was the case, they would be assigned the lead professional. With all these cases, uh, I would say the vast majority needed a multi-agency response. So the, it wasn't the lead professional's role to solve the problem, but it was to coordinate, it was to get the action plan agreed and to coordinate the implementation of the action plan. Yes, um, what I was getting at is what was the discipline of the lead professional? Was uh, it a I mean, how many were police, how many were this, that, and the other, what, what yeah. were they? So the, all the, uh, from the police side, they were all general policing. Yeah. So general policing patrol, there, were no, there was nobody specialized. And what they did with them at the outset was basically, they, uh, they piggybacked lots of other uh, training. So social services, if they were having a, uh, a development day, they would be invited to go on that. So their knowledge was really limited, which was why it was surprising that the results in terms of the general policing uh, people who were lead professionals got such success. Yes, um, I'm still not getting what I want. Um, how many of those lead professionals were police? How many of them were social workers, how many of them were mental health professionals? Can you give me a... So a I'd, I'd have to go back to that pie chart. So 41% were the early action teams, from the early action teams, which was police. Uh, and uh, there were other police from other specialised units, such as child protection or uh, domestic violence. So I would say non-police were probably accounted for something like about 35, 40%.
All right. Can I, can I see that again? Um, Unfortunately, is, okay, uh, you I, did have it there. I just wasn't paying attention at that point. Um, <laughs> well, some of, these, some of these acronyms are not um, self-evident. Did you just make up those acronyms? Yeah. I yeah, I, I thought I'd get a particularly tricky question from uh, Professor Clark, so I made it as ambiguous as I possibly could. <laughs> no, I, and, and to be honest, that's why I said at the time I need to do something with with this because there are so many acronyms. Uh, so, for example, transforming lives, which you can see at the top. Uh, transforming lives was a, an early intervention uh, team which was based in one of the local government facilities, primarily to try and deal with, with some of these issues. Uh, we had charities, we had Age UK, who took somebody I have to say the, the charities were less inclined to be the lead professional, but were excellent in terms of joining the, uh, the multidisciplinary teams. What, what was the big chunk on the, the blue here? That's, on the right? that's the early action team. So they were the uh, non-specialist police yeah. teams. I, I suppose what I was wondering was whether really the approach that you were taking which is very good, but I was wondering if this is the sort of thing that um, that uh, the social work field should be doing. Uh, and uh, many argued that it should be. But uh, <clears throat> one, one of the issues uh, which I'd sort of mentioned very quickly is this issue about thresholds. So they, lots of these people would be referred to social services. Social services would review them and say, you're not quite at a threshold yet for a social worker to be assigned to your case. But uh, they were still continually ringing the police. So basically the police, because of their concern with demand, were forced into a situation, I think, that they had to do something about it. And you would think it would be better done by a different organization, but because the brunt of it was being felt by the police, they, they uh, stepped in. So we can, um, we can push the problem-oriented approach into the social services, not just into the police, right? Well, I, I think there's a much wider question. So with all the money being taken out of public sector, uh, so mental health, for example, uh, more and more facilities being closed, more mental health issues uh, being seen on the streets. Uh, often the only uh, available resource in the middle of the night uh, who can get there in an emergency is often the police. I'd find it, I think in theory you could, I think one of the issues when resources are tight is who's holding the ball at the time. It's very difficult to throw it to somebody who wants to catch it. I think well, that's one of the issues. Andrew? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the presentations. My question is, beyond getting buy-in from super controllers and chiefs of police and everything else, if you can get all that done, it seems to me that also many of these approaches are quite resource intensive. And I was wondering in both cases were additional funds allocated to solve these problems or was it merely a shift in priority where you didn't get extra money but now for the inspections people got retasked to that because for me that's a big issue with problem-oriented approaches thank you yeah I th I, uh, if i take it first i think one of the issues to uh, be considered is how much how much resources it's already taking so one of these things is that you know you get 17 calls uh, a week from an address, you don't really count up how many addresses you're getting those 17 calls for, so they're all often not taken as the whole. In, in this particular example, there was some pump priming, uh, some money which supported uh, the formation of the early action teams. <clears throat> that ran out in 18 months and they continued, uh, so it was mainly to see if the concept would work. And, and as far as I know, with the California Highway Patrol, they reassigned uh, a handful of people uh, to these new duties. Um, uh, uh, in a Goldstein submission, we asked them to indicate, you know, well, what did this cost? Uh, and it was over a million dollars a year, uh, counting in all of their salaries and benefits and so on and so forth, as well as some of the materials that they produced and so on. So there was definitely an expense involved. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, they didn't... Uh, 
uh, get new money specifically for that from the legislature, but I'm sure every time they went to the legislature after that, you know, they used that as part of their uh, general uh, explanation for why they needed more funding. Um, the, the, the program does continue, the SAFE, S-A-F-E, which I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, uh, the F is undoubtedly farm. Um, uh, uh, it does continue, uh, but in fact, it has a smaller uh, staffing than it did initially. So I think it's, it's become a regularized uh, a function within the agency. Uh, but there's definitely still a cost. Uh, there was no formal cost-benefit analysis. I mean, needless to say, lives saved and, and that sort of thing uh, has a huge benefit. Um, and uh, probably considering the potential fatalities, most people would probably say, you know, it paid for itself and then some. But that there was no, no direct analysis of that. Thank you. Sylvia. Uh, this was all Saunders re relating back to what Ron was talking about, really, um, was in the UK we have statutory partnerships uh, in law, in the Crime and Disorder Act, which says that there are a number of organisations, including the police, that have, and it says, equal responsibility to deal with crime and disorder. However, you ask any member of the public who is it that they will contact about their problem, whether it's mental health, whether or not it's any sort of other antisocial issue, and it will be the police. Often for what Stuart has just said, because who are the people that are there 24-7? Uh, but there, there is a lack of understanding, I think, amongst people within the UK, or certainly within England and Wales, about actually who else has a responsibility? And we've got to a situation now that I think the police in England and Wales have this fear of not doing. And that is quite a big thing, I think. Fear of not attending, fear of not going, in case of what, what happens if they don't attend. Even if it's really it's a social worker's responsibility or a mental health worker's responsibility or a health issue. So it's a, I think it's an issue, a problem we've got at the moment. Yeah, I'm increasingly thinking that, like it or not, police are moving into a role, a different function in this problem-oriented approach that I sometimes think of as police as brokers of social responsibility. And maybe police ought to embrace that role more directly, not as ultimately responsible for all these problems, but preliminarily responsible for identifying them and then helping to apportion responsibility and get others to do things. We could say we, we wish other agencies and entities would adopt that role voluntarily, but when they don't, who's going to do it? And maybe the police. Yeah. Might be on point or slightly off point, but uh, in the U.S., uh, over just, the, I would say, the last three or four or five years, uh, I've seen quite a few agency, police agencies uh, either form much stronger partnerships with social service and mental health agencies, uh, in, in, including joint response to people in crisis, you know, at the moment, uh, or in a few cases, even police departments now hiring social workers. You know, they have a vacancy for a police officer and they decide to hire a social worker instead, um, arguing that that person can handle so many things that the police officers really are not equipped not trained and equipped to handle anyway. Um, I don't know that that's a big trend, but I've seen quite a few examples of it in the U.S. Uh, and I, I don't, for several decades, I don't think we saw much of that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and just on that, uh, Mike Barton, who's a police chief in the U.K., might, might know more about this, but I'm seeing, uh, we've, we've monitored the mental health, response to mental health, and it's taken a bigger and bigger chunk out of uh, police officer resources and there was a real push to work uh, on a joint teams so mental health nurse police uh, and you know often people with mental health illness would end up in police premises and there's been a real pushback a because it's not good for the person to be uh, often incarcerated and there's been recent legislation about that but really just spending time with with the police isn't particularly good for their mental health so <laughs> so there's more and more and recently there's a discussion uh, 
come surrounding the, the policy in how, uh, how the police respond to it, and there is more of now of a demarcation of role, I see. Can I uh, yeah. another um, Since you uh, brought up your name. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm that Mike Barton. And at, uh, I checked this morning, I was still a police chief. Um, <laughs> But, but hourly checks are, are now m mandatory. Um, the, uh, in answer to that question, number one, the super controller there was the Home Secretary, now the Prime Minister, who pretty much made the definition of a place of safety not a police cell, whereas police cells were de rigueur the definition of place of safety when you were enforcing Section 136 of the Mental Health Act, which was somebody who you thought was in danger uh, and exposed to uh, in the public se in the in a public place. Secondarily, when we talk about uh, uh, hiring social workers, I now have four mental health nurses working in my police department between 2 p.m. and midnight every day, and they're dealing with between 30 and 35 cases a day. So, and the great benefit that we have there is they have immediate access because they are mental health nurses working for the local health people. They've got immediate access to the database. So now before we hired those uh, people, uh, those 30 to 35 people, the only uh, intervention we would have made uh, a year ago is ultimately they would be brought to a police cell or we would have taken them to a mental health hospital and on average, we would then have two officers sat with them for up to 24 hours. Rick? Yeah, there, there is uh, at least one other group that some of this can be assigned to or, or uh, that's willing to take them. Uh, in our city in Winnipeg in Canada, we have paramedics who are available, um, ambulance people, if that term is, uh, is not uh, common here. Uh, and what they did was they went through their list of frequent flyers, the people who, who were most often uh, calling them. And the calls go to, the 911 calls go to both, uh, for both health and, and policing matters. And what they've done is they, they've taken their, their list of, of most frequent callers and they proactively have uh, paramedics in cars who go out and proactively visit these folks daily or every other day or you know, whatever schedule is needed. And that's taken a, a good deal of burden off what the police are doing because of the overlap in the list. So, so that's another group that, that is really good to partner with. And uh, we're doing that with the police service and health officials with a, a group of chronically addicted downtown homeless people. And the partnerships with paramedics has been really, really successful for us. Yeah, I think that uh, this push to get other agencies to think in this similar problem-oriented way. I feel like we, we, the police, have been pushing the fire service for 20, 30 years to start analyzing their own data. And sort of as a last observation here, maybe you can comment on this, it occurs to me that among the animating factors, the motivating factors that get police to take a look at problems should be, and, and often is, the data. The data just pops out and we say, well, it's pretty obvious something's going on here. But there's this interesting dynamic or, or uh, qualification with thinking about victims. When it comes to offenders, every offender who gets arrested gets a unique identifying number. And so we can easily track those people. How often do they offend? And we can search our files readily, and police regularly do. The same is true with addresses and places. We have a street address, and that's a unique identifying number. And so we re regularly do these top 10 call addresses and such. We don't have the same unique identifying number for our victims. And so it may be one of the, the reasons that victims don't come to our attention unless police are proactively looking for that. It's not routinely popping up on the screen as we've got a chronic victim problem. In either of these initiatives, has, well, I guess it doesn't, especially in the Lancashire initiative, has anything been done to change the record system such that it, these people might more readily come to attention? Uh, no, is the, is the quick answer. And I'm being more... I'm being contacted by uh, police agencies across the UK 
trying to do a similar thing. And uh, I was approached by somebody from a particular force, which won't be mentioned, and they had uh, 200 calls from one particular individual uh, in the previous month. And they were used, they're actually using multiple phones. Uh, they were a uh, victim in a wide variety of particular issues, and it is just so difficult. And I think the sooner, you know, we, we do think of a better system for this, the easier problem identification will be. Yeah. Okay, well, we're out of time. If you'd join me in thanking Stuart and Gary. And thank you.